Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Curious Competitor Podcast. I'm your host today, current New Jersey Devils defenseman, Connor Carrick. Week in, week out, we discuss holistic on ice and off ice, at least for me, uh, growth and our goals and how we can fuel these goals. And our guest today embodies that. He is uh, an intense individual. He is a hard advice uh, driven person. He is Nathan Gerby at five foot four, 169 pounds. He's the shortest skater in NHL history. This is an exciting podcast for me for a couple of reasons. Number one, he was the first player uh, in the National Hockey League I've had reach out and ask, you know, to be able to come uh, together on the podcast and share our stories, which I think is super cool given we've never uh, played together. Another reason was I was a huge fan of Nathan Gerby's in 2008 when he was winning a national title with the Boston College Eagles, uh, where he was a Hobie Baker Award finalist, which is the award given to college hockey's best player. He was a phenom, and I was super interested to see how this player of this height and this size and this tenacity would translate uh, to the NHL. There was certainly a lot of doubt, uh, but he's been able to accumulate 426 National Hockey League uh, games, which I know you know, he should be proud of, but it's clear uh, in our time today, he's clearly hungry for more. Uh, stick around and listen for our podcast today with Nathan Gerby, as he has no shortage of energy and intensity, and I look forward to sharing his story with you today. Let's do this. Hey guys, it's producer Colin here. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to support us, we've created a membership program that brings access to more exclusive content and AMAs to help you become a more curious competitor. At the end of the episode, I will explain more about what those benefits are. Or if you want to find out more information about it now, please visit patreon.com forward slash the curious competitor. Now, without further delay, here's today's episode. Nathan Gerby, welcome to the Curious Competitor Podcast, man. I uh, We're talking a little bit off air, and I think we're going to get into the nitty gritty today. I think it's uh, personal values, you know, communication, um, you know, your relationship with sacrifice. These are all things that I've been able to learn are, are very important to you and I don't know, man. When you think back around your career, you know, origin story, where do you want to start? How far back do you want to go? <laughs> I can go go right back, uh, you know, probably even before I started playing hockey. It's, I, I grew up very different. I grew up a uh, different mentality than, than a lot of people. Um, and people are shocked when they hear some of the stories because they can't believe that you've gone through this. But I, I look at it as I went through it and it built me to who I am today and, and that that I would never change in a million years. <laughs> so what are some of those stories? Like when you look back, role models, uh, origin for your career, because I first got to know you when you were absolutely tearing apart college hockey. And I was a huge fan of yours, just given your size. And I wasn't the biggest guy. And, and you know, I had, you know, some of the you're too small comments, not nearly to the extent that uh, you've had, you know, like my probably the most self-conscious I ever was about my size was I remember I went to go scout the uh, 1992 national team development program. And they had like yeah. John Merrill, six, four, <laughs> Derek Forbert, six, six, uh, Jared Tenardi, six, seven, <laughs> Stephen John, six, four. And I'm like, I'm never going to make this fucking team. Like, <laughs> like I wanted to play at this U S development team. And I was like, oh, these guys are monsters. Um, yeah. you know, but how did you use that narrative. Cause that was obviously that was the outside uh, talk, yeah. right? Nathan Gerby's too small. He's never, his game's never going to translate to pro hockey. He's not gonna be able yeah. to produce the same way. Um, you know, but what was the conversation in your head to combat that? Yeah. One, one thing I've always been really good at, and I'll, and I'll share this before I share some, some deeper stories is that I've never let external factors, um, you know, push the internal voice inside me. Um, and that's, you know, it takes work. It's not something that's easy. Um, I, I can block things out and it's not going to get to me cause I have, you know, a lot of self-awareness and I'm full of confidence, um, within myself that, you know, all the noise out there, it don't matter to me. Um, those, those people don't care. Those people don't know, you know, what I do every day or go through to be, um, ready for the, for the moment that I have. I love that. So where yeah. did you... Where were you able to build that thick skin? Like, was it a, a family <laughs> member? Was it, you know, your relationship with your dad? Was it, you yeah. know, did you have siblings growing up? It's, you know, it's probably everything. I, I, so I'm the youngest of six kids. Um, so we're growing up in a house and, you know, we didn't, we didn't have money. We didn't have money. You know, we lived off welfare. So we knew, um, 
what it was like to grind and in and, and, and a lot of ways. And it's kind of funny now I enjoy grinding um, and I look to grind and I like it. So it, it kind of perfect for how we grew up. But yeah, youngest of six kids, um, nothing was ever easy or given, um, you know, to go back when I first started playing hockey um, and some of my stories with my parents and, and my dad and siblings is, you know, if I didn't play good and, and no lie, like this is, this is like true stuff. If I didn't play good in terms of working hard, cause my dad was all about work. Um, you know, we would get, we would get about five miles from home after every game. This is late at night. This is like, we're looking at nine thirty, ten, 10 pitch dark, um, dirt road. That's where we lived on. Mm-hmm. So he pulls over, you know, and he says, get out. And I'd be like, okay. You know, I remember the first times like, what do you want me to do? He's like, you're running home. He's like, you don't want to work at the rink. You're going to work now. Um, so yeah, I would run home in the dark. He would follow me with his headlights and yeah, you'd have bats swooping over your head and everything. And, you know, as a kid, you know, you're just going through it and, 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 and you're not really learning the life lessons at that time. But as time goes on, you keep doing these things, you're learning. Um, not only that, you're building the self-awareness and self-confidence that nobody else is doing this. Um, I might be five, four, but no one's pushing cars um, at a young age. So going to the rink with that mentality that, yeah, I might be five, four, but you're not doing what I do. Um, and I'm probably going to run you over. So yeah, stories like that, um, pushing cars around parking lots. Um, all of us, even my sisters had to do it. Um, you know, my father was very strict on work. Um, whatever you guys do, if it's not hockey, it's being a doctor, whatever nurse for my sister, you're going to work and you're going to be the hardest worker. Um, and that's it. Like that's, that was his message. You know, there was games I would play. And if the pond was frozen at home, we would get home late from the games. And my father would be like, put your equipment back on, you know, you're going outside and I would skate on the pond and do conditioning cone drills. And again, if you're not working at the rink, you're going to waste my time. You're, you're going to learn to work now. Um, so those, that mentality is just, yeah, it kind of keeps pushing me to today. And I don't think I'll ever lose it. Well, I'm starting to have that conversation in my own family because Lexi and I work. I know you're a father of four, right? Yeah. Lexi and I are expecting our first child in February. And, yeah, congratulations. You know, thank you. Yeah, we're both, you know, work ethic, something very central, you know, to both of us. And it's something that we're trying to, you know, how do you foster it other than, yeah. you know, <laughs> uh, just blatantly demanding it. And then I, yeah. you know, I think back to, you know, because hockey is an expensive sport, both in terms of time yeah. time commitment and financially. And, you know, even in our family, like there were c- consistent conversations around, listen, Connor, you want to play triple A, you know, where yeah. the big dogs play and, and, and it's a big bill, you know, to, mm-hmm. to you know, foot every month. Um, there's a certain level of competitiveness and intensity yeah. that, you know, my dad in particular, my mom too. Those were interesting conversations. My mom would yeah. pull me aside and be like, hey, your dad's seriously pissed off. Like you got to pick it up at the rank. I don't know what's going on. I didn't watch last (laughs) game, but you know, he's ready to put you down to double a. And it's like, I remember the feedback my dad would get from time to time indirectly. I would see other parents sort of criticize, you know, maybe the maturity of the conversations we were having, um, you know, accusations maybe of, of tiger parenting. And I never felt that like they were always from just a place of accountability. And yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, I think back, you know, super grateful for, you know, some of those harder conversations and harder yeah. car rides. And yeah, I, I don't know. I'm trying to think of it's, it's a uh, very important. And I've learned this cause you know, I've had a, had a, a rough upbringing in terms of work, but I appreciate it and it's built me who I am. But a lot of people don't have the ability to look back and reflect and have a positive thought on what their parents were doing. Um, my parents did their best with what they had. Um, in the best yeah. of their knowledge and whether or not they knew what they were teaching us and how they were doing it, but they taught us all the right things. Um, so when I'm, you know, my wife and I, when we're getting on the same page of parenting, I have a lot of my dad's values. Um, it's not going to leave me because what we do in our house is we create these non-negotiables and we ain't talking about it cause they're non-negotiables. Um, we can have fun. We can love, we can do all that, but you don't, don't overstep these things in the house because this is where it's going to be an issue. Um, and, 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 you know, it's respect, it's hard work, it's attitude. And I don't want to hear the words. I can't, you know, those are, those are our non-negotiables in the house. I don't want to, we're not talking about it. I'll teach you about it, but yeah. So that's, 
we kind of create that now. Now how you teach that in the process is, you know, everyone's different. Um, for me, I'd bring my kids to the track. Why? Because my dad did it to me. My mom did it to me. Mm. Um, the mental strength that you have, the self-talking, the doubts as you're running circles is tremendous. Um, so I do that with my kids. Uh, my daughter run, will run a mile and then I'll talk with her. I'll talk her through adversity and, you know, Hey, do you feel like quitting? You know, and she'll say, no, I'm like, okay, good push. Keep finishing, you know, like keep doing that. And, you know, when she finishes, they're the happiest things in the world. Um, so I believe it's so important as I look through my childhood as the amount of adversity that I faced that gave me confidence, um, to take down any challenge obstacle come my way because people today, they're scared of change. They're scared of obstacles. They're scared. Um, it's a fear based world now. And yeah, I'm the opposite. Look for the challenge, look for the obstacle and let's map out a plan. And how do we attack that? Um, you know, what level of accountability are we holding yourself to, to attack that, you know, your habits, do they align? Um, so it's, yeah, it's a lot with parenting, but hey, it's the greatest, it's the greatest job in the world. And I, I love, um, teaching my kids all about it and, and pushing them. I want them to go through adversity. Um, it's important and I'll, and I'll walk them through it too, though. I'm not going to leave them out to dry and, you know, we'll teach them, we'll walk them through, but I expect them to, uh, to get through challenges. So when you think about your own career, tactically, how are you sort of refueling this, this tank, this tank of ambition, this tank of, you know, personal resilience? Yeah. Uh, what resources do you lean on and what habits do you sort of have in place uh, to get back to a centered place day in, day out? Because you and I both know, like, yeah. the emotional pull, the tide of an NHL season can pull you out to deep waters in a hurry if you're yeah. not, you know, doing yeah. the work to, to get, you know, recentered. Yep. Uh, week in, week, week out. Cause just the, the pace of schedule, the flights, the lack of sleep, like it's, you're pretty primed to, uh, yeah. engage in, you know, self-sabotage or, uh, you know, really think from a place of, of fear, especially you and I both know, like when you're on yeah. the fringes of NHL lineups, yeah. you're dealing with a, a leash that's, you know, generally yeah. pretty tight. Um, how have you navigated some of those ups and downs of, of pro hockey and what does that look like in terms of your personal life? Like, are there books you read? Are there mantras mm -hmm. or, or things that you write down things on your stick? Yeah. Anything that we can sort of gift the audience? Yeah, I'm a little crazy. So don't, you know, the audience, I just, no, I'm, I'm nuts. Um, so what I, what I do is I break things down. So life hockey, the, it's the same thing. Um, you know, we're talking about the same habits. We're talking about all the same details that we want in both. Right. Um, so what I explain to people, how I, what I do at the rink, how you work, how you, you know, accountability, your leadership. Well, that doesn't change when you leave the rink, um, for me. So for me, I make sure home base is good. Um, you know, how's things going? Things are communicated. Things are going well. Um, we're in a good headspace there. Um, that translates to work and now I go to work and now it's, you know, are, are my habits here? Am I working? Um, asking yourself questions, but also answering those questions, honestly. Um, that for me gives me, you know, a calmness, um, to what I'm doing, but to go off what you're saying, my habits, they don't change from the rink in personal life. Um, it's the same thing. Um, I care more about the personal life than I do at the rink habits, but they're never going to change. Uh, you can't pay me enough to change, but it's, uh, you know, I always tell people stick to the good habits, no matter how hard of a time it is. It could be three years down the road that you might get your opportunity, but if you stick with those good habits, you'll never regret anything. Um, the biggest thing we can have is regret when we leave the game. And I'm making sure I will never have any um, because the habits, I'm not gonna, not gonna change them. If things are going poor for 10 games, doesn't mean I'm gonna all of a sudden create bad habits and do something different, do this different. No, I'm gonna stick with the same stuff. I'm gonna continually to self-talk and, and, and mentally prepare. And that's all you can do. Um, as far as routines, I've created routines on off days, game days, and practice days. So I have three, three sets of routines um, that I try to change just so my, my body and my mind know what's, what day it is, what, what's the difference. Um, yeah, and, and from there, you kind of just, you know, play with how you feel. Um, yeah, I, I'm a little crazy. Like, you know, I like to get up early. So I'm, I'm up, no clock, no alarm, 4 a.m. Um, usually when I'm at home, I train at 4 a.m. Um, when I'm here in Columbus, I'll do schoolwork or something or, or, or do some journaling or writing and, 
and try to learn from there. But I like it. And again, people always say, why do you get up early? Well, it's not for hockey. I'm not training specifically for hockey all the time. It's for my mind. Um, it's for my habits. It's, and, and we, and we briefly message about the cold tub going in the cold tubs, not, you know, I'm not like preaching this huge, which is great for wellness, but it's more about my mind. It's more about continually doing something I don't want to do. <laughs> it's, I don't wake up excited to jump into it. Um, I, I hate it, but I know, you know, you're, you're pushing your mind to not hesitate and yeah, you just want to act on things. And that's how I try to approach the game, hard times, routines, everything. I try to try to interchange all of them. You know, I think that's interesting because there's this, all the, a lot of the people that I look up to, uh, you know, including someone like yourself, there mm-hmm. is this relationship where they are comfortable with doing maybe things that would be considered undesirable at first before they yeah. start. They're willing to go through short-term discomfort for mm-hmm. delayed grat- gratification. They have a, a yeah. good concept of short-term action and long-term results. And they're constantly yeah. oscillating between the relationship between the two. And I think that, you know, in pro hockey, when I think of, you know, there are players that are, are gifted, you know, beyond belief and, yeah. and they're, they're physical specimens and they're the superstars. They're the jerseys we buy, yeah. you know, for our relatives on Christmas time and ask them to sign after the yeah. game and that kind of thing. And they're the yeah. jerseys we try to find for our charity <laughs> functions. And, um, but you know, the, the, this mental side, this ability to emotionally, uh, think of the big picture, think of yeah. their career as this journey. Mm-hmm. Um, those are the players that I find that end up from the middle of the pack sticking around the longest, yeah. like it's this longevity game, uh, in terms of, I'm particularly interested in your off day routine. Yeah. What are some things that you'll do off day? Cause I think that's a secret weapon. Like, mm-hmm. b- because you will have these sneaky sort of off days during an NHL season where, yeah. okay, it, you played uh, Saturday night, maybe you played Sunday night off night, uh, you know, Monday, yeah. but you're playing Tuesday again. So all of a sudden yep. it's pretty easy to sit on the couch all day on Monday <laughs> and relax and throw Monday night football on and, and whatever, you know, but you're, you're playing in 24 hours. So what is something that you'll use to, to keep that cadence of feeling good in season? Uh, I don't think I've, I rarely ever take a day off. Um, so I still, I'm still in my routine. I still wake up early. Um, now, now where you need to gauge your body. Um, do I need a wellness day? Um, so for me in my home, I've created this little wellness area with sauna, cold tub, hot tub, and you know, red light therapy and all that. So do I need to, what do I need? Um, so maybe I'll do some movement. Maybe I'll do a biking, maybe I'll do running, um, just mobility stuff and then hit wellness stuff. Um, for me, I like to get it all done before kids wake up. Um, that way when the kids wake up, dad's home for the day and then I can, you know, whatever the schedule brings or whatever my wife has on the schedule, I'm, I'm in, um, because I got my stuff taken care of early. Um, so that's how I try to change it, but I'm always going to be active. I need to keep my body moving. Um, I'm one of those people, if I don't move for, for like a day or two, I just, I don't feel good. Um, yeah. and I don't like it. So I'm continually moving and, and doing stuff, but you know, your head, you're, you're free. Um, I don't have to go to the rink. I could just play with my kids. So I mentally let go of a lot. Uh, I don't think about hockey too much on off days. Um, especially with the kids, you're so busy. You, I don't have time to reflect on hockey on off days. Um, so on off days for hockey, completely uh, shut it off. In terms of your practice and game day prep, like how are you, what would you consider to be some of your, because every guy that I've talked to that really is invested in becoming their personal best, they have mm-hmm. this like toolbox of what they would consider secret weapons, right? So for certain yeah. guys that might be extended video work, they really feel if they're clear on their reads, like you can feel mm-hmm. as, as good as you can in the national hockey league. If you're not ready yeah. to make the right reads, it's irrelevant. Other guys, you know, uh, I'm maybe more one of these where I'm more body focused. I love to feel mm-hmm. good and, and, you know, not overly similarly. I'll, you know, lean on the sauna, you know, cold yeah. therapy. I got like a power plate at home and that's sort of my post-practice off day, you know, secret yeah. weapon. What would be a uh, practice day game day? You know, some of the things that you lean on. Uh, I would say visualization. I'm, I'm huge into that. Um, and I, and I've done this for a long time, probably dating back to college, I think, um, is 
I, I, I sit down, quiet space, quiet room, um, usually put on headphones, nothing in it, just to block out noise. And I try to run through every scenario that happens during games. Um, I play it in my head. I play it a few ways. Um, that, that's so when I know when I'm in that situation, I know my options. Um, and I'm moving the puck quick or I'm moving quick. So I try to replay every scenario. And it's, you know, people say, well, there's so many scenarios that could happen, which is true, but there's so many ways out of um, different scenarios. Like, again, if you get the puck in the corner, you... You know, I'm in my head. I'm reading different scenario that oh, if a defenseman's there, you know, maybe I got to move it quickly here, move my body. Um, you know, I get the puck here in the shooting area. What am I looking for? Or, you know, off a of face off, I'm trying to jump as fast as I can. How do, can I see that? Am I visualizing it? Is my power there? Um, and then after that, like you, I'm more body focused. Um, I train every single practice day. Um, game day, I sometimes if I feel like I need to do power work in the morning, I'll do it. Um, but if I don't, I'll pull back on that, but it's all feel, man. Like I, I, I try to mentally be as clear as I can to think. And then, you know, I physically want to feel good. Who are some of your, just from a training perspective, who are some of your favorite resources or influences that you've had that kind of shape um, your approach? It's crazy. So yeah, I had my, obviously my father with the crazy pushing the cars and running, um, but I'm extremely blessed for that because people weren't doing that back then. Um, so I felt one step ahead of everybody else, but I ended up having back surgery and I, I ended up reaching out to Ben Prentice in Connecticut. And, you know, my wife and I, we, yeah, at the time we we're like, Hey, we have no kids. So let's go move to Connecticut. Um, so we moved to Connecticut for the summers. I think I stayed about six summers until we started having more and more kids. Um, Ben Prentice was, was a game changer for me. Um, Again, I love the work. He knows I love the work. He tries to reel me in constantly. Um, and we have great conversation battles. Like, and he knows I'm going to do something no matter what he says. You know, so he's going to try to tell me what to do. <laughs> he's like, you're going to do it at least, so at least do this. Um, if you're going to go to the track, do this. Um, but he, he was able, and again, like when I got there, you know, guys like Martin St. Louis were there. Uh, another big reason why I wanted to go. Um, just to be around guys like that. I know these guys like to work. I know they have similar mentality, but Ben was able to teach me more about, you know, sometimes less is more. Um, you know, I was more, 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 you know, like, Oh, I don't play good. I need two workouts, you know, like, Oh, I don't feel good. I'm gonna go three workouts. And Ben was like, just no, (laughs) you know, he, he would, you know, you get an hour in the gym and then you're done. Like you're, you're out of here. I'm not letting you back in. We'll lock the doors. You're not allowed back in. Um, so Ben was huge for me, um, gave me a ton of knowledge, helped me out, helped me fix my body, correct it, and, and still continually is to help me. And, and uh, yeah, I enjoy, I enjoy Ben. I'm lucky for him. I'm thankful to have gone down that path. Um, sometimes people, we want to reach out to people and they enter your life. And sometimes that's God's grace. I don't, I don't know why. Um, I've never really been to Connecticut much. And from Michigan, we just up and moved to Connecticut and stayed there. So. Yeah, we were lucky. Yeah, I've heard I've heard awesome things about uh, Ben Prentice and his approach and the way he's able to mm-hmm. push certain guys and reel other guys in. I think he yeah. gets sort of the the mental component too of the athlete he's working with, and that just yep. comes with you know uh, an experienced trainer. And I think that yeah. you you touched on it a little bit. That there is we live in this world of I wear one right. I wear this aura ring, and yeah. and we're in the uh, the world of optimization now as athletes, yeah. and we want to do the sports science and what would be best and all those things are great and, and, and worth considering, but I'm a big fan of the stubborn will of the athlete, you know, sort Mm -hmm. of the old school, you know, Michael Jordan approach where for the love of the game, like, sure, you know, biometrically, maybe it is best. I, you know, get off the ice, but mentally, you know, you can't put a price on what I know about myself from a preparation standpoint, where Mm -hmm. I stand, you know, comparison to everyone else. And I, I kind of, it was a little bit of a slippery slope. That was when I think back to earlier in my career, I had a, a, a deep desire to outwork at all costs, yeah. to outwork at all costs. And then I had some people kind of grab me and similarly try and reel me back in. Yeah. And I think I got a little too cute with some of my training at certain points where I was <laughs> losing focus on, you know, what had sort of gotten me there. And I, I'm starting yeah. to revisit, um, you know, they're having the respect I do again for yeah. the sheer workload, the sheer volume. And I, I remember... Yeah. I was training with Riley Sheehan and there was a story about this where he's talking about Pavel Datsyuk and it sounds simple, uh, but it was advice I was just giving my brother the other day. 
where, you know, uh, Pavel Datsuk, obviously a legend, like, you yeah. know, you're a, a Michigan <laughs> boy and, yeah. and I, he was, he was awesome to watch for me growing up, but he said he would grab like one of the young guys after practice and it was non-negotiable. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, Pav needs his one-on-one buddy. And he said he would just play for like 10 minutes, one-on-one yeah. keep away. And for anyone that plays keep away on ice <laughs> knows 10 minutes is a long, it's a lot. It's, it's a hard. long rep. That'd be the hardest drill um, ever. I guess him in particular, <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't be super excited about that. But so in terms of, you know, your career thus far, when you think of some of the highs and lows, what are some of your proudest moments as a pro? Cause you're, you're 33 now, yeah. you know, I hope you played a 45 yeah. and beyond yeah. and I know that's how you think. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and, and I've certainly, you know, won't take no for an answer from, from anybody uh, after, yeah. you know, seeing people like you kind of pave the way, but you know, when you look back, what are, you know, some of your favorites, uh, most proudest moments? Um, you know, I, I, I try to reflect, but I would say this past year was, was a huge, uh, moment because it taught me so much. Um, so coming back from Europe, I had the opportunity to sign back in here, back in, back in the NHL and, um, you know, which real quick, which real quick, uh, just for our audience, I had that on my notes where a lot of players, you know, that are kind of in your situation where you're up in the NHL, you're down to the minors, you know, yeah. you're kind of neither here nor there. You don't necessarily fit. Europe eventually becomes a great option where these contracts yeah. come up. They're usually offering some term, you know, that yeah. the North American leagues aren't offering. And I thought that was super interesting because a lot of players, they consider it a farewell tour. It's, yeah. I want to go see the Swiss Alps with my family and, you know, I'm going to play hard for sure, but yeah, it's, it's just a little bit different bite when they show up over there. And, you know, I was, so I'm, I'm glad you uh, are bringing this up. Yeah. It's a different life. Um, with my mentality, I don't fit. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I'm too driven. I'm too, uh, I'm not stopping. Um, I don't, I don't care what country I'm in or I don't care if guys work out or do anything. I'm not stopping and I'll pull as many guys with me as I can. Um, but it was different, different people. I, essentially, I realized I need to be around elite thinkers. Um, I, I need to be around elite hockey minds. And, you know, I wanted to get back. I remember when I went, my agent said, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to ever come back and play. And I said, yeah, when the time comes, we'll see. Let us say watch. Um, you know, so I was lucky to get the opportunity to come back because I know not a lot of guys do. Um, and to go back into our, some of our earlier conversations for these younger kids and guys who last long and end up getting more and more contracts, your reputation is all you have at the end of the day. And these GMs and these, you know, coaches, they all communicate. So if, if you are, have a good reputation, people are willing to take a risk on you. Um, again, with what you're doing with the risk now, that's, that's up to you. Um, but you will get the opportunity because of your reputation and fortunately at the time they said, Hey, we need leadership down in Cleveland as much as possible. You're going to have a chance to make Columbus. But if you don't, you need to go down in Cleveland and be, be a leader. And for me, it was like, yeah, no problem. Um, you know, I was thankful for that opportunity. I wanted to come back and yeah, I was very, very, very lucky to get it. I have a, a lot of respect for guys where it doesn't matter, you know, what league necessarily it says they're playing on and you know, playing mm-hmm. in on their Jersey. Uh, their approach is going to be the same. I remember hearing a story. I was playing with a kid named Colin Smith with the Toronto Marlies. And we were, he was ranting and raving about Matt Hunwick and how he'd played with him yeah. in the American league. Cause honey, I think he was in, I think it was Colorado. He was sort of struggling. Yeah. Right. And then he ended up, you know, doing really well with Toronto and then signed another deal with, yeah. with Buffalo. And he's like, man, you wouldn't believe he goes, I, cause I've seen him now at the Leafs, like his approach yeah. was identical. Like the way that he tried to win games, the details with which he practiced, the, yeah. the intention was he, when he was on a penalty kill, like he wasn't kind of yeah. in the lane. Like he really yeah. was in the lane uh, with the purpose of getting hit, you know, with a puck. And I just, you know, immediately checked like, cause I'm very role model driven. Yeah. I, I really lean on the people that have done the things that when I look up, I want to be able to do what they've done. And Matt Honwick's one of those guys. Uh, he yeah. was even before I went to Michigan, that was where, I think yeah. I was recruited by uh, Mel Pearson at the time. And he's like, you know, I, you remind me of, of Matt Hunwick. And I remember yeah. looking him up and all his numbers and, and uh, who were other than Marty St. Louis, like what was it about, you know, some of your role models? Like what were some of the yeah. things that you would watch and try and learn when you were with, you know, Ben Prentice and Marty St. Louis 
uh, you know, running on the track and, and yeah. when you were watching film and that kind of thing, what were things that you would look for? Um, honestly, I'm not a huge film guy. Uh, I'm pretty old school with, I, I know, I know like when I, when I play a bad game or have bad, I know you don't need to tell me, um, you know, I'll fix it. I'll correct it. Um, and I won't do it again. Um, I don't need the video to show me I played bad. Um, I could tell you the second I play bad and, you know, very honest with myself, but you know, when I was with Marty, I'm just, I tried to pick his brain because when he, the way he thinks the game, he's much different, smaller player than I am, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, but obviously he's much greater, but we're just completely different styles. Um, I try to, at a five, four, I play more of a power, power style. Um, I'd rather run through guys. I would rather do stuff. And, and then, you know, if you get the opportunity, maybe skill will, will take over in certain areas. But Marty was a thinker. Um, Marty could see the game. He could see plays. So I tried to pick his brain a little bit about that. Um, whether, we're, you know, Marty's funny, whether we're playing, you know, shinny hockey, three and three, five and five, he's always trying to like set up plays. And I found that amazing because when I play that, I'm like, I don't care. Um, and I remember I just got bought out by Buffalo when I came. So mm -hmm. I was already like down in the dumps. So I was like, uh, I don't know if I'll ever be back in the NHL and coming off back surgery. And we're playing five on five, just, just in the summer, like you usually do. And I get back to the bench and Marty's like, Hey, like, when you get the puck on the wall in this scenario, I always like to be in this part of the ice. So just throw it, throw the puck blindly. And I'm looking at him. I'm like, we're playing summer hockey for one, two. I just got bought out. So I'm not confident at all. I'm like, what? Well, but he was like, that's his mindset. You know, he was set plays. He was the puck's going to be here. Then I'm going to be here automatically. Just throw it there. Don't even look. Um, different than the way I thought the game, it changed my perspective a bit. I tried to look for more areas like that where you can have those set plays, but you know, just to watch him do that at such an older age at the time too. And I think like that year, he probably led the league in, in points. He was the oldest to lead the lead. I know at one of those years and it was just amazing. I'm watching him like see this thing. I'm like, Oh wow. Like this guy's you now he's elite thinking on the ice. He's got skill and drive and determination, all that. But his brain is, is, is way up there the way he sees the game. That's what I was curious how, what your relationship with Marty St. Louis was. Cause you know, when I, think of him and I've never met him. And, but the yeah. stories I've heard, I remember one of my, you know, sort of my Ben Prentice was a guy named Kevin Ziegler. You know, I was with yeah. Octagon at the time was mm -hmm. my agency and uh, Ziegs was, you know, the strength consultant for the agency. And, and yep. he really, uh, he had a good relationship with my coach out of Chicago. So anyway, he was the strength coach in Tampa when, mm -hmm. when uh, Marty was there and he would just tell me these stories of like Marty St. Louis was on this particular two on one and he wanted to make this backhand pass and he duffed it. Yeah. Duffed it, put it in the D man skates, break up the play, whatever. And he goes for 30 minutes the next day. All he did was just pick one spot, spot on the wall and send, you know, backhand yeah. after backhand after backhand against the wall. So yeah. not r immediately I'm thinking, wow, really cool. Like, uh, appreciation for the fundamentals, similar to like what you'd hear of Kobe Bryant, yeah. right? Where he's yeah. just gonna no one in his face, you know, put down, you know, a thousand, a uh, thousand makes before practice even starts. Yeah. And then I'd also heard when I was in Toronto, you know, Sheldon Keefe uh, had, you know, kind of talked about how Marty was one of his influences where, you know, Marty would kind of get on him as, uh, mm -hmm. as a line mate and be like, you know, I, I need you to make a play there. And Sheldon would say something yeah. to the effect of, and this is all secondhand. So I'm sure if I screwed up, someone will remind me, but <laughs> they were like, you know, Sh Sheldon said something like I had nothing. Like I just, <laughs> I, I took what I had. And Marty was like, no, no, I get that but I need you to create something. Yeah. So it's like, okay, so you see this thinking strategic part. And then I've heard stories, you know, I've seen the videos of him, you know, throwing up outside Prentice on the, <laughs> yeah. you know, the sled pushes and <laughs> yeah. how he do like physical testing where he would, uh, I heard the story when he was in Tampa where he would, he would test in the morning Yeah. and then he'd stay at the rink all day to see, to make sure that his scores had upheld, <laughs> at, you know, where he'd wanted them. And I'm just thinking yeah. of, Right. Cause sometimes you get these guys, you know, where they're workhorses, they're, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they're a hammer and the whole world's a nail. They're just going to work, 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 yeah. you know, all day. And then you have this other side of it where guys sometimes, you know, think they're smarter in the game and they want to yeah. think everybody. Yep. And Marty to me was like, Oh, that's what a blend looks like. That's what yeah. all, all of it in one, one brain, one body looks like. And yeah, he's know, competitive, my, you know, I, and, I mean, all the best are, you know, those, yeah, those, uh, he's, he's competitive. I, I appreciate him. When I went to the apprentice gym, my my main goal is like, I'm going to outwork Marty. Like that's, I'm going to go there and I'm going to outwork him in everything. 
And I remember my wife was like, isn't he like 38? And at the time I went there, I was like 25. I was like, yeah, <laughs> I was like, he's 38, but I'm still going to outwork him. I don't care how old he is, you know? So yeah, he's still just, a Hall of Famer. Yeah. Just to go there and see how hard he's working at that age. And it's, yeah, I, I've, I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. And sometimes when I need advice with hockey, I'll, I'll ask him, you know, when I went to Europe and coming back, I talked to him a little bit and yeah, I appreciate his knowledge and, and what he's gone through. What was that first game back after you came back from Europe? What was that like? Like how different was, was the game? How different, different did it feel? Yeah, it was different. Um, especially coming from the big ice. I came mid season. Um, it was different. I felt like everything was flying by the league. I felt got like five years younger. Um, it did. By, it did. You're way, seeing, yeah. I was like looking at the rosters of these teams. I'm like, I don't know these people. Like, uh, where did all these people that I played with and like, where are they now? Like, but yeah, it was crazy how young it was. Different game, less physical. Um, um, but it's, you know, it's still a fast game. It's still highly skilled. And, you know, the game's good. I think it's in a good place. Um, it's in a real good place. I do too. I wonder, uh, I wonder how it's going to go. Cause if, if you look across, like I think basketball was on a similar trajectory where it was like big and slow, you know, it was yeah. all about the two points and getting tied to the rim. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, they kind of revolutionized the game with the three point and the game got small and skilled. Yeah. And all of a sudden they were just going to chuck threes from wherever they could. Yeah. And now all of a sudden it's like this NBA player 3.0 where it's like, yeah. it's going to be big and skilled, you know? And yeah. I wonder, I think that that eventually is what the NHL is going to do. And yeah. Um, I, I thought I say the same thing when people ask me what the difference are. Cause my first year was 2013, 2014. Yep. The game's completely revolutionized in terms yeah. of how teams, you know, build the, you know, the bottom half of their lineup and, and yeah. how they leverage certain youth players and, and the leash that guys get. I don't know. Yeah. It's uh. It'll be really interesting, interesting to see. Yeah, it's different. Like I came in 2008 and it was a different game. You had to earn everything, you know, like I, I remember them telling me you're going to the minors no matter what. Um, and once you prove yourself there, we'll maybe give you a chance, you know, and you got to work your way up the lineup. You might start fourth line, third line, and, and you know, you got to work your way up. So now it's like, hey, we're going to throw you right away at the second line and see how you do with the first 20, 25 games, you know, so it's different. Uh, not that it's wrong, not that it's bad. It's just, it's changed. Um, and, and the game seems to be in a good spot. So when you think of hockey as a whole, we'll put our, our, you know, big thinking caps on when you think yep. of hockey as a whole and, and with the amount of work that you do personally away from the rank with the amount of, uh, you know, reading and trying to read across different disciplines, like we were talking mm -hmm. about a little off the air. Um, what are some, I guess, what are some of the favorite attributes of some of the, your, your yeah. favorite leaders that you've met in hockey? Uh, and where do you feel that, you know, hockey's going uh, in yeah. terms of, you know, the, the leadership style, the communication, you know, I, I think we both, we've never shared a locker room, but uh, we definitely have some similar experiences there. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, leadership to me is the most, one of the most important things to have in that locker room and different types of leadership. Cause there's, many different types, you know, there's the vocal, there's the silent and it's, but you need to have that. Um, we're both blessed that we've been around a lot of good people. Um, and that's what we, I notice in hockey mostly is that there's a lot of good people in hockey. Um, it's not many people you could point out and say like, Oh, that guy's not a good person. Um, but that's to me, that's not true. Cause I, I I've met a lot of good people and I've tried to take knowledge from everybody. Um, all, you know, when I first came in, whether it was guys like Mike Greer or Rob Niedemeyer or, you know, Craig Reve, like I tried to take knowledge from these guys because they were just good people, good pros, um, taught me a lot, showed me a lot, um, reeled me in a lot. Um, so I, I, I explain I what that means real that. quick, reeled you yeah. in. Cause <laughs> I've been reeled in a couple of times and people might not know if they're not from hockey, what that term exactly <laughs> mine's, refers mine's to. Mine's more on the ice. Like when I, so when I first came in, obviously being smaller, um, starting professional career, I had a lot to prove to myself. Um, whether I, I don't know. I don't know if people were thinking that, but I assumed they were thinking that. So when I first came in the American league, I mean, I was, you know, I was a rat. I was getting jumped probably every night, um, starting five on five brawls everywhere. And, you know, just stirring up as much as I can. And when I got up to Buffalo, um, I was doing the same thing. Um, I was running around, I was spearing people and, you know, I didn't care who was who. Um, and I remember Mike Greer would always like grab me like, Hey, that's enough. Like, just go play the game. Like, stop, stop running around. You don't need to like run Chara or try to run Chara. Um, 
But on the second hand, <laughs> but on the That's second awesome. hand, he would he would be the first guy to grab me and say, "Hey, this team needs more energy. I need you to go run around." Um, so he had that like pull, you know. But he he's still probably one of the greatest teammates I've had. Um, Mike Greer. Yeah, he's still. He was our assistant, so I I, I appreciate uh, I appreciate shed light him. on what he was like as a player. Yeah, just the calmness, the humility he brought to a locker room, the leadership. Uh, yeah, he was he was fantastic for me. Yeah, I'll be sad to miss him. I know in New Jersey, and I, yeah. it's interesting you say that because I uh, was curious what he was like as a player because he did have that you know sense of calm, that groundedness. Yeah, you know, that was sometimes rare to see on on an NHL bench. Usually, oh, yeah. you know, you you get some fiery people. The job breeds a, yeah. a certain type, and yeah. But when um, he snapped, everybody was like, "Whoa, whoa!" All right, Gruzy snapped. Let's everyone be quiet, and not say a word. Like. <laughs> Well, that comes back to that leadership style, right? When you're able to yeah. hold your cards close and kind of choose yep. your words carefully, they have a certain weight when you when you use them. I'm more of an yeah. energy guy in the room. I always wanted to be, you know, Captain Serious, and yeah. I, I just couldn't contain it every year. <laughs> I'm like, you know, all of a sudden the song's on the locker room. I'm dancing around and you know getting guys, you know, loosened up, and and I've uh, I just stopped faking, you know, being something I wasn't. I, I yeah. just wasn't. Uh, no, that that's Mr. an important Tetsu. part of the locker room. You know, like you need. People like that because young kids come in and they're quiet. Um, they'd rather do video games. Um, so it's a different locker room um, between now and, and back then. So you need the energy. You need people to feel uncomfortable. Um, and with feeling uncomfortable, they'll end up being comfortable in the locker room. So, you know, you need that stuff. Yeah. So I asked you, and I, I, I normally keep the podcast, you know, with a positive frame of mind and, and, mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. But I also think that we'd be remiss if we don't touch on some of our failures in our career. Yeah. Cause I know that being someone that you can tell you genuinely have an appetite for challenge. Some yeah. people can say that out loud, but you can, you can feel it when you talk and, and yep. you know, the intensity in your eyes, what are some of your biggest failures in the game and what was your road recovery like? Like when did you realize that you're failing. And I guess to even start, mm -hmm. what, what does failure in pro hockey look like to you? Um, you know, it changes over the years because as you get older, wisdom, uh, takes over a little bit. Uh, so when I first came into the pro hockey, failing to me was not making a team out of the camp. Mm -hmm. Um, I came and I, and I held myself to these high expectations. And, you know, when you get sent down that first time, you know, it was my first time experience of being like brought to a room to say, Hey, you didn't make the team. You're going down. Um, I never had that. Um, so that was new to me and I couldn't believe, uh, yeah, I remember just being so upset. Um, you know, you feel like you just got the wind knocked out of you. You're like, well, I, I don't feel like playing hockey, I guess. I don't know. Like, yeah. so be, you, you, you know, you regroup, um, you come back, um, you get humbled and, and you work your way back. Um, I, what I've learned a lot with failure and I, and reflection is one of the greatest tools that, you know, a person can have to grow. Um, yeah, with failure, it becomes, you, you learn so much, um, you learn more. Um, I've learned about more about the ego, you know, what's actually, yeah. wh when failure happens, what's actually hurt? It's your ego. Um, so what I've learned is to kind of keep my ego out of things. Um, I wouldn't know I'm failing because I kept my ego out of it. I'm not hurt. So as I'm being sent down, say, you know, last two years ago or last year, it doesn't matter because I'm going to go down and do my job. Um, you know, for me, it's a failure to not make the team. Sure. Yes. I'm not hurt by it. Um, do I have the ability to understand? Yes. Um, but I'm going to go down and, and, and do my job and do what I need to do, um, for the organization and, and wait for that opportunity to, to do it again and hopefully seize that opportunity the next time and not, not fail. But yeah, ha having the ability to really yeah. Take out your ego. Um, be who you are, uh, work through failure. And I don't necessarily view it as failure. Learn, just learn from it. Why, why didn't you make the team? Um, yeah, certain things when I went to Europe and, and was going on waivers with the Rangers. So I went to Europe, you know, that, that was failure, but I was able to take ego out of it and say, I'm going to go and get better in Europe. I'm going to go there and work on, you know, confidence, holding the puck again, uh, feeling good offensively. And then I'm going to come back, which a lot of people said, you're never going to be able to come back. 
um, once you go. But I was, I said, well, we'll see. I'm going to feel good and confident and I'll come back. Um, now coming back, I had to go down to the minors and prove myself again. So it's kind of like a little bit of a circle, yeah. um, back to square one. But again, it doesn't bother me because I know who I am. I know what I'm going to do and it doesn't change. Um, failure, hard times, adversity, my habits aren't changing because that's who I am. So I'm going to just keep doing the right thing and what I know is right. And yeah, maybe, maybe a year down the road, two years, three years, four years, five, it doesn't matter. Um, I wouldn't do it any other way. I wouldn't want bad habits. Um, so I always tell people, people are like, well, I continue to do these things and nothing happens. I was like, well, would you rather continually not do the things? And they're like, well, no. I'm like, okay, then keep doing the things. Like, I don't, yeah, yeah if the opportunity's not there, it's not there. Um, but, but you're continually building these habits that later on in life, you're going to be living in those habits. Um, and that's another thing people don't realize is that, you know, through failure and, and everything, when you're learning, you're just building yourself for later. You're building your resume. Um, you're building your own home that you're living in. Um, yeah, you're, you're building that through your habits. So stick with the good habits. Don't think failure needs to change everything. Reflect, be honest, self-awareness. Um, yeah, and then, and then make it happen. Then, yeah, have a drive. Uh, have a passion. Enjoy it. Love it. Uh, we, we get so lost in this game because it's a business, but, you know, enjoy the game. I mean, we don't, you don't get to do this forever. Um, I'm going on year 13 and it's like, I, I don't know. Is, is it going to be year 14? I'm done 15. I don't know. Can I play 16 years? I don't know. Um, but I'm going to enjoy this while I'm doing it. And I'm going to keep teaching and helping, helping young kids learn. And, you know, I get just as much satisfaction helping someone in the minors than they get to play their first game. And it's like, Oh, that's awesome. Because, you know, I was able to help push that kid mentally past maybe a time of being uncomfortable and now he gets his chance and I, and I hope he, uh, I hope he learns from it. Well, that's why you're so valuable, you know, for what you're able to provide for a locker room, yeah. NHL or AHL. And that's where yeah. these GMs, you know, have to decipher. There's a lot of talent at that grade uh, of player yeah. in the world. And, you know, that's where some of these intangible, you know, things come to mind. And I guess I asked the question about failure because I, you know, when I was younger, I describe failure now as as long as I'm leaving the Jersey in a better place, because the New Jersey Devils mm-hmm. are bigger than me. The National Hockey League's bigger than me. Whatever yeah. team, you know, you know, hopefully I played for the Devils for another, you know, 12, yeah. 15 years, whatever, and um, retire that way. But if, you know, if I was with another club, because when I was younger, like I remember <laughs> I would have these experiences where I would get off the ice and I would have felt like a failure, like maybe, uh, you know, I didn't get to play in the last five minutes, right? Yeah. Or I was off the power play. I was on the unit, you know, all night. And then they took me off for the third rep because we hadn't scored. Yeah. And I would check the stat sheet and, you know, I'd be talking to my dad. I'd be like, I just didn't feel like I, you know, I was, you know, pissed off about my ice time tonight. I, I made a mistake and I didn't play that much. My dad would be like, you played 19 minutes tonight. Like, what'd, yeah. you, ex- <laughs> what'd you expect? Like, yeah. did you play, expect to play 35? Like, <laughs> and so I, I just started to realize that my, like my scope in terms of what I thought you know, failure was, it was, it was too tight. Like the game is so yeah. good. You yeah. have to respect, uh, the other, the other opponent. And it's not like, I, I don't want to say the key was to make my goal smaller. Cause I, yeah. I wouldn't say that, but it was more so that I realized if I kept this current expectation for myself, yeah, I was going to be such a source of negative momentum that I was, I was going to yeah. self-destruct. Like yeah. I, I was going to beat myself before the game did. Yeah. And it was something that you know, there were times, particularly in Toronto, because I remember I was, you know, very young, skilled team. And there was like this gold rush, like the, you know, it was everything yeah. in Leafland where we're going to, we're going to build this contender and you're either in the boat or, or getting shipped out. And that's yeah. kind of how they operated. Right. And you just yeah. want, wanted to prove I'm one of the core, I'm one of the core. And, and yeah. I think that, you know, I, to keep it in, in terms of, uh, you know, cliche terms, I was gripping the stick at times. And I think yeah. that, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I was really able to be my own source of, of negative bias during a career where like, I didn't need any help. I had coaches that were certainly hard enough on me, you know, playing yeah. in that fan base, you know, it can get yeah. uh, pretty noisy in your head in a hurry. And, you know, so I, I try to, uh, cause I can be pretty pom pom me on social media yeah. and stuff like that and pretend like yeah. everything's positive, but yeah. there's definitely been a couple of times in my career where that, that word you used earlier in our podcast, that regret, you know, trying to avoid it at all costs. Yeah. In terms of, um, you know, what's next for you 
with your career, like we're going through, you know, 2020, what advice have you been giving yourself? What has your reflection, you know, look like? Cause I yeah. know there's been no shortage of time to do that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, how can we apply some of these principles maybe for, you know, younger players out there for parents listening, yeah. um, you know, trying to, you know, frankly steal from someone with a resume like yours. Yeah. And this, this, this time I hope people have an opportunity to reflect on all aspects of their life, whether it's their personal relationships or uh, a relationship with the kids um, or your work or whatever it is. I, I hope, because it's funny, like what we talk about, again, like you said in the beginning, there's no difference in what we're talking about in terms of hockey um, could be corporate business or how you want to run things in your family. There's no difference. Um, it all, it all comes down to, you know, the habits um, who you are, what you stand for, um, the communication that you're going to bring to the table, whether it's the family business or whatever it is, um, trying to improve that. Um, I, I approach all, all aspects of my life the same as I approach hockey. I'm going to try to outwork everyone. I'm going to be very, very honest with myself. I'll hold myself to a very high standard of accountability. I'm not going to be afraid to you know, admit my mistakes and I'm going to push to get better. Um, and, and I, and I hope that's, I hope that advice can resonate with everybody because those, there's no difference in what we do or what somebody else is doing in their job. It's the same stuff. Um, continue to try to get better or whatever it's parenting, continually trying to get better. That's it. Um, there's going to be down times, uh, a lot of adversity to go through different types of diversity, but you know, stick, stick with the good stuff, stick with the good habits. Um, don't change them uh, because it's supposed to be who you are. It's not, you know, don't fake it. <laughs> what I, I am curious, just in terms of uh, on ice wise, when you say good habits, like what are some things tangibly that you bring to the rink? So for example, what I've, I'll have a little journal and I'll try to write down particular, you know, kind of like my own personal practice plan. Like, I'll of course, yeah. you know, try and do my very best for whatever the team has, you know, prescribed. Yep. But if it's been some time since I've taken some one timers, like, mm -hmm. you know, scoring chances, how hard they are to come by in the yeah. NHL. Like, oh, yeah. If you don't make good on one, it might be another two weeks before you get a, another good look, especially <laughs> yeah. as a defenseman. Right. So, yeah. you know, you'll, you'll take one timers for a month until you really get your, your real opportunity to bang it home yeah. in a game. Um, what are some, on ice practice habits that you bring with you aside from whatever the team's plan is. Yeah. So I, I always have certain skills, uh, skill drills. I do certain, um, skating drills, edge stuff. Um, I try to pull in all the young guys. Uh, it's easier in the American league cause you get the time. So usually I'll try to run like 20 minutes of skills and, mm -hmm. and skating before practice starts. Um, you know, in the NHL, you may get a little bit of time here and there, um, to do that. But yeah, have a goal. Like so many people go on the ice and they just, and you see them at the end of practice that they just, some are flipping pucks at center ice. Some are shooting on the wall. Some just grab a pile of pucks and shoot them with no, no agenda. Um, but yeah, have a plan, uh, know what you're practicing for me. I know, I know during the game, I'm like my, if I feel like my footwork isn't good or where I need to be, I'm not escaping through defensemen. I'm not getting out of the corner. So I'll, I'll have my drills that work on the foot speed. I'll have my edges mm -hmm. drills. Um, so I'll do some of that until I feel good. I was like, okay, I feel like that's, that's going to translate. Um, is it certain shooting, um, an area on the ice that maybe I've gotten three looks, but for some reason I can't get good shots off. Um, you know, doing repetitions of that. Um, you know, so it's, it's just, again, it's, it's the reflection of your own game. It's the evaluation of what you feel is not going right during the game or how you feel that's when I try to make the changes either after practice or I'll go out early and, and do it before. Yeah. I like that. Cause that's something that I had to, you know, sort of figure out when I got to the NHL was just the ongoing nature. You kind of get to have like a little practice plan, like a little, a little yeah. bit of the first bit of the week in the American league where it's, yeah. Okay. You're on the ice Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you're starting to ramp up, you know, Friday, yep. Saturday, you're playing. Um, so you could kind of, you know, be a little bit more creative with that consistent yeah. chunk of time versus the NHL. Like I had to, I had to kind of give up what perfect was like, you know, you, yeah. you'd be expecting, <laughs> you know, an opportunity to practice all of a sudden, uh, your, your team's not going to the rink that night because your coach <laughs> played their, your best player 36 yeah. minutes last night. Now all of a sudden it's an option. So now all of a yeah. sudden you're looking at, you're like, okay, I played, 
seven minutes last night. We didn't practice the day before. We're not practicing today. So really yeah. I've had seven minutes on the ice in the last three days and we're playing again tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, I had to, you know, start to reconsider, you know, I had to do the most with the least sometimes. And that's a yeah. different skill set. When you're, when you're yep. attached to perfect, uh, you can kind of get in your own way of, of, you know, doing your best. Yeah. It's a, uh, and it's funny you say that because I'm one of those. That I'm like, I have to go on the ice every day. Um, I have to touch the puck. I have to feel it. And here at Columbus, um, Torts doesn't like morning skate. Um, just doesn't like it. He doesn't want anyone on the ice. There's time where he, he allows it, but he just doesn't like it. And there's no talking about it, no negotiations. Um, may have to fake an injury to go on sometime to say I got to test my uh, hip flexor or something so I can go on the ice. But it's, yeah, so that with that, you can't control it. And so it's getting, now it's changing your mind frame. Like it's okay. Um, I've had to have those self talks with myself a lot. I'm like, Oh, it's okay. You're going to, you're going to be okay in the game. Like, you know, it's not like you haven't been playing hockey for, you know, this many years. It's okay to miss like two days of the morning skate. I'm going to be okay. Um, so it's funny you say that cause it's true. Cause I, I look forward to going on the ice. I love it. And then you get there and they're like, Oh, no skate. And you're like, Oh, well, what do you mean? No skate. Like, Oh, we're not going on the ice. And it's like, well, what am I going to do now? Um, well, it's like that. Is, so you were talking about it earlier where you were grateful for the relationship with your dad and, and all the work you yeah. had done because you knew other people weren't doing it. So it's like, okay, the mental strength is coming from the fact that I've established that I know I've outworked everybody. I've done yeah. things that no one else has. There's, yep. you know, everyone else was operating at a seven. I was at a 10 in terms of work ethic. Well, if you've now, if you've messed with my preparation, <laughs> there's a chance you may have messed with my mental strength or, yeah. or resiliency come game time. So it was, you I was similar to that and kind of had to break ties. Like I remember particularly there was one time in, uh, it was like after the Christmas schedule, we had, yeah. you know, three days off to go home, you know, yep. whatever it was, um, show up, you know, we're on the road playing Arizona. The next day was like a canceled, uh, practice. And then the next yeah. game was a one o'clock game. So all of a sudden it was like, I'd been on the ice twice in eight days <laughs> and you, you do the best you can. And, yeah. In terms of operationally in pro hockey, uh, who have been some of your favorite leaders to be around? Uh, could be teammates, could be coaches, could be GMs. Who have been some people that, because we all subconsciously do it as players, where yeah. we're always you know taking note of what the people above us are doing. Yes, I would do that. No, I would do things differently that yeah. way. Uh, who have been some of the people that you've learned the most from and, and what has yeah. that been? Yeah, we talk about we talked about Mike Greer earlier. He's, you know, as a teammate, he's one of my, my favorite uh you know, going back to Buffalo, then, then I was able to be around, you know, someone who I got close with is Jason Palmonville. Um, mm -hmm. you know, he, he, yeah, you watched him and he was just a professional every day. Um, you know, he never changed anything. He, you know, you knew what he was doing all the time. And, and as time went on, you learned to appreciate it. And as you know, when you, when you first come in pro hockey, you're always watching people be like, Oh, that guy's played this long. What does he do on the ice? What does he do here? And then you watch him for an extended period of time. You're like, Oh, okay. That's why like he continues to do everything right. Um, he barely ever has a bad game. So you, so you watch people like that. And as I went to Carolina, then I was around, you know, guys like Eric Stahl, um, who, who worked, worked pretty hard and on the ice could drive the forest, but wanted the puck. So he was different than other leaders I've seen he was more demanding on the ice. Like, give me the puck cause I can do it. Um, which I, in Buffalo, I, ha I wasn't around that type of leader. So it was different. Um, so you got to see that style. It's like, Oh, he's like confident. Like he, that's what makes Eric Stahl really, really good is that he is really confident and he wants that puck. Um, again, different than leaders I've seen, you know? So, and I, I've, this is my fourth organization now. And I would say John Tortorella is someone who I love listening to and watching because you can learn so much, not just about hockey, but about mental strength, mental toughness, and what you can push your body and mind through. Um, so he's a huge person in that area that I, I enjoy learning from. Well, Tort Stevens, one of those guys, I never had him as a coach, but as a player, I think across the league, we're always curious yeah. about, you know, these type <laughs> of guys where, yeah. There's a lot of smart hockey minds, but he's been coaching, you know, decades yeah, now and has, has learned to, you know, stick around his teams play differently now. And you just, yeah. you wonder, um, you know, how he's been able to, you know, grow personally and, and what resources, maybe we'll get him on the podcast. I'll, I'll have you text <laughs> towards for me. No, just yeah, kind of. we'll, we'll push him, but he's, uh, he's fun to listen to because he's, uh, you know, a lot of psychology, a lot of mental strength, uh, 
you know, pushing your mind, tricking your mind, you know, telling your mind you're not tired goes a long way. Um, especially in today's generation, kids, kids are tired. You know, if they, oh, we work too much, we're tired. We need the day off. And it's like, no, no, we need to work. Um, and, and you know, you push your mind through that. Um, so he's, he's perfect for that. Um, being able to watch him through the years and it seems like he's been a, adapting to change to the way the game's going. And everyone knows his teams are competitive. They bring a certain edge to, to their game and you know, you're not going to get anything different, you know, out of his teams. I love that. And now we did, the reason we did connect was, uh, you know, John Yerlhai from NHL PA had, yeah. you know, connected us and made mention, you know, career wise, you might have goals in terms of, you know, public speaking, yeah. uh, post hockey. What, what about that world interests you? How are you, you know, frankly, what is going to be your message? How's your message going to be different? Um, and, you know, frankly, I guess what I'm getting at is, is why are I, I have my own uh, belief as to why, but why are you qualified, you know, to do it and, and what's going to be your message? Yeah, I think, well, you know, when, when you do reflection on, you know, I'm a very deep thinker and I do a reflection. I don't think my purpose here was to be the smallest player in the NHL. I don't, that's not my purpose. Um, I think my purpose was to go through something very tough and experience. And now what's my way of giving back? Um, and that's essentially what I care about. So when I look at my journey, and again, I, I call it my journey, but it's not about me, this journey. It's not this journey's never been about me. Um, it's not about what I'm doing. It's not about rah, rah, me. You know, it's about the ability now to inspire people to do things in their life that they don't think they can do. Um, you know, for me, it's about, you know, making my family proud and, and sharing this message of try to help everybody in whatever situation they're, they're in. Because I think, you know, the power of mind is pretty strong and, and people uh, underestimate it. And... Yeah, so I'm I'm very uh, anxious to get into public speaking. Uh, yeah, talking about accountability, leadership, mental strength, um, all those things. And I guess what makes me qualified is, yeah, just just the years of the knowledge, experience, and going through, you know, these adverse adversity and going through the t rough times is that. I have solutions to try to get out of it. Um, there might not be solutions people like. I don't know. But, you know, it starts with yourself and, and it starts with uh, learning more about yourself and pushing more because no one's giving you anything, especially in this game. No one's handing me anything or no one's handing you anything. And, you know, it's the same thing out in life. No one's no one's giving you jobs for free. And, you know, so you got to earn earn what you want. And, yeah, I think uh, that's going to be my message. But, yeah, again, it's for me, it's just serving to other people. Um, that's yeah, what I believe. Love that. What I want to do. And I, I really hope. I can inspire people through my experiences, not trying to sell people anything. Uh, it's just what I've gone through. It's, uh, you know, it's just personal, personal experiences. Well, you definitely walk the walk. And I always think that's yeah. the most important part. You have to embody, you know, what you're preaching and, yeah. uh, Gerbs, this was awesome, man. I really appreciate, you know, all your time and thank you. Um, you know, frankly, sharing your story, you're obviously a diesel. I'd heard that from <laughs> afar from guys that had played, played with <laughs> and against you. Thank you. Uh, you know, I've, I've been on the other side of it. Um, you know, so I appreciate uh, everything you brought today to the podcast. Thanks, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. This is, this is great. I like listening. Thanks, brother. All right. Thank you. First off, I want to end the podcast with uh, thank you to all of our listeners who are still with us. If you didn't leave halfway through this podcast to go start training or taking on a new goal yourself from listening to uh, Nathan Gerby's intensity, uh, I appreciate you still sticking with us. And to Gerby, uh, to Gerbs, who run unofficial nickname basis after meeting each other virtually today. Um, he's a monster. I'd, I'd heard stories of his work ethic uh, from afar. I'd heard the famous, you know, pushing cars story from his dad, uh, you know, from, from players that had played against him. And I actually, I remember similarly, there was a player I remember I was playing and there was a big tournament uh, in Blaine, Minnesota. It was like the super rank. It had eight rinks. And this was the weekend where uh, I was a midget minor player. So I was 15 years old and really starting to get recruited uh, by colleges. And this is the tournament where, you know, sort of my, my first uh, couple offers came about, which if I remember back were, I think I'd first talked to Dartmouth and then it was Air Force. So I pictured myself being a, a fighter pilot there for a hot second. Uh, but I remember there was this particular game where the Chicago Young Americans, uh, CYA was what we called them, was another AAA team in the Chicagoland area. 
they had three players come over from Russia that year. They were kind of a, a lower end team the year prior, uh, but they had, I, I forget, actually, there was two D-men. Artem Sergeyev, I think was his name, and I forget the other one. I think his last name was started with a Z, but uh, the star of the bunch was Alexander Galchenyuk. And my dad and I, my dad had this RV, and so we'd parked it out in the parking lot uh, where we would just sleep and grill out before the games and things like that. And I remember we're sitting there in between games, and all of a sudden, out comes three players with CYA jerseys, Chicago Young American jerseys. And they've, they're in full uniform with their helmets on, mouth guards in, and it's, it might be 90 degrees outside. We're playing five games in about two and a half days that weekend. And this was my first introduction uh, to Alexander Galchenyuk, who would go on to become the first overall OHL pick and go in the top five, you know, third overall to Montreal, uh, Montreal Canadiens in 2012, my draft year. And Alexander Galchenyuk and a couple of his teammates are running around this soccer field right next to the rink uh, based off a poor performance. And I know that's, you know, maybe some, some hard advice and, and, and some tough love uh, but that brings me to my first recap point of the podcast today, which there is no substitute for energy. There is no substitute for hard work and there is no uh, substitute for intensity. If a lot of our listeners, you know, are aspiring hockey players, if you want to become a player in the National Hockey League, it's a hard game played by uh, people who do not uh, turn the other cheek, frankly, when it's time to get nitty gritty. And so I encourage our listener to be realistic with the amount of work it's going to take for you to actualize your goal. Uh, and I won't go on and on about, you know, stories there, but, you know, frankly, there is no substitute for intensity and hard work. The second thing I want to talk about today is do not take no for an answer. And there were a couple of examples in Nathan Gerby's career, which is still ongoing, where, you know, the odds were stacked against him or the way that you know, pro hockey sort of operating. We, we touched on it a little bit during the podcast where he went over to Europe for a couple of years. For a lot of players, that is their farewell tour. And I know we, we talked about that, but it's, I knew before we even talked today that just the fact that he had come back, he had went over there with the intention of being able to earn the opportunity to come back. And that's exactly what he said. So I was not shocked. The third uh, point I want to bring up is this concept of maintaining perspective. And when we are able to engage with our journey as that, we are able to recall that this is a journey, an open-ended journey in which we are always training to become the next best version of ourselves. And there really is no finish line. It can lighten our relationship uh, with failure. Things don't seem so daunting or so all world consuming uh, when they happen. Because, you know, uh, Nathan ended the podcast with it where he was discussing you know, part of this entire career doesn't even feel like it's for him. It's simply an experience, uh, simply a journey that he is going through to package up and gift to his family, to show an example of what a life uh, well lived uh, and, and a, what a life filled with hard work can look like, you know, for his children, for uh, the groups of people that he wants to eventually, you know, speak to publicly uh, to inspire motivation. And so I, I really challenge you, our, our listener, uh, as I do every week, I, I try to come up with a little something to, you know, fuel you until the next podcast when we spend some time together. How can we consider uh, having a greater perspective? How can we consider the big picture in, you know, our day-to-day -day lives, especially, you know, we're still recording on, it's 2020, it's been a trying year. Uh, how can we both come up with, you know, digestible goals uh, for the short term so that we can act short term, but how can we think and feel long term? How can we think with our legacy in mind? How do we want to be remembered? How do we want to be uh, talked about, uh, frankly, when we leave this earth? So thank you for joining me on my journey to become a more curious competitor. I urge you do the same. Look forward to doing it again next week. Hey guys, it's producer Colin. I hope you enjoyed the show. I want to let you guys know about a new way you can support the Curious Competitor podcast. We are super proud to have launched a Patreon with access to additional content, exclusive AMAs, and loyalty merchandise. If you could spare the cost of a latte a month, it would go a long way in supporting the expenses involved with the podcast, as well as supporting the people that make it happen. If you do not currently have the means to do so, please don't feel the need to donate. We will be providing this podcast continuously, 
and hope you can find value in these conversations. If you're interested in supporting, visit patreon.com forward slash the curious competitor or check out the link in the show notes. Any support of the podcast is greatly appreciated. And as always, we look forward to seeing you next week.